All right, so this is uh, Philosophical Psychology. It's class number six, and it's on, we are going to finish up utility and focus, begin with Kant. Um, I have been reading your posts. There are still not very many posts that have come in, but um, I did want to mention a few things just to give you the sense of how different the posts can be. It seems like some of the group discussions were pretty productive because the students said, you know, we're talking about what each other said. So if you are in a group that's not productive, don't waste time. Just come in, you know, come to me and say, I need to be put in another group and I can do it right away. Because at this point, you know, there are enough students who are on board that we can keep the energy going. A um, uh, couple, one student wanted me to clarify the old law and the new law. But in general, I'll just say that according to St. Thomas doctrine, the old law was the law that was imposed externally and had sort of external rewards for Moses, for example, he wasn't pure in heart <laughs> when God called him to lead the Hebrews out, you know, from Egypt. He said, no, no, I don't want to do this. You know, take my brother <laughs> or Moses got mad and then he couldn't go. I mean, he had a personality, right? And he had an attitude. So the old law is the one that sort of imposes from without the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus came, you know, he, he said, I've come to, um, I haven't come to, to destroy the old law, but I've come that it should be fulfilled. And his big thing was purity of heart. So that he wants you to change your heart. And on an Aristotelian model, it would just see, it would just be, if you have a strong character, you actually want to be virtuous. And you will put, uh, you will rise to occasions, right? You will take on problems because you just want to exercise as many of the virtues as you can. So I think in psychology, they call that you internalize or it becomes part of your character. So, so I hope that's helpful. And the reason I, I teach it and mention it is that if you are Muslim, you should be able to know that difference, right? There must be stories about, I, Muhammad said there's the external Quran and the internal Quran, right? The one that you've internalized that's in your mind. Um, and I, I think every major religion makes that distinction between the doctrine that gets imposed from without and actually the, the strength of character that has taken it on. It's, it's just become second nature. So that was, I hope that's helpful. Pooja wanted me to talk about that. Um, then when it came to um, nonviolent demonstrations, uh, a student from Myanmar was talking about her country. And I would love to talk more about that. But I, I guess we probably have to move on. Although if anybody wants to organize a, a subgroup to have a conversation about it, that would be great. And she said that they tried nonviolence, but the military always makes it violent, right? And then so what she can do or what you, any of you can do, that's what happened with Martin Luther King. So a lot of my students at Lyon really think those demonstrations were 100% nonviolent, and that is not true. <laughs> and um, there were FBI agents and CIA agents that were trying to incite violence so that you could blame the movement. Um, and that happened also with Black Lives Matter. So you, you always have to be alert to finding out what is the source of the violence? And also then 
they blame people supporting the status quo blame the movement for being violent, right? Just because when there is a movement, there's violence, they claim that the cause of the movement, that the movement caused the violence. And that's a logical fallacy, but it's also off, often just flat out false. So if someone who knows a lot about the Myanmar wants to go and look at Martin Luther King's letter and talk about whether the nonviolent demonstrators did they get that kind of training? Um, did a lot? Did a lot of these same things sort of happen? Was it a similar kind of position? Um, it's discrimination based on ethnicity or religion or something. So if you wanted to do that, you can do that. I was just listening to the radio. A woman just recently wrote a book about the ACT UP movement, which was during AIDS when the the people getting AIDS were demonstrating and it was supposed to be nonviolent, but it became violent um, in some cases. But she said, we had to go back to the letter from the Birmingham jail and we did exactly what it said. So I think this is a classic letter. Like it tells, it explains patterns that, was, that still exist. Then somebody else was talking about Gandhi, of course, and the movement for Indian independence. And it wasn't entirely nonviolent, right? But especially after the India-Pakistan split. And so I don't wanna touch that one with a 10 foot pole because I don't know enough. And I don't know each of you gets taught something that's maybe different from, right? The Pakistan version might be different than the um, India version uh, or the Hindu version might be different than the Muslim version. I just don't want to go there. Um, but if you all, if one of you wants to sort of sort that out, what the things that I like to talk about are Western colonialism, right? I like to talk about the things that I know and I like to be critical of my tradition, because I think the people who should be the most critical are the ones who love it the most or have most are most saturated with that tradition, rather than some outsider coming in and, and telling you who you are or what you know, I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, but today's reading is very critical of the US. Um, and I think it's, I don't, again, what I want you to think about is do your countries get brainwashed by this kind of stuff? Uh, are the leaders in your countries, political leaders, educational leaders, uh, economic leaders, are they just Western wannabes? Are they trying to be like this or do they have a critical stance on it? Do they sort of know that this hasn't led America to a very good place? And we don't necessarily want to imitate that at all. The other issue is that this was written before COVID-19 and what you could write about, which again, I would love to know, to learn about is have, has the attitude of people in developing countries changed after they watch the way the US has all the scientists and the most vaccines and also the most anti-science and anti-vaccine, right? Does that cause you to step back and think about what's going on in that culture, right? How are they understanding happiness, pleasure, pain, and freedom? And so the lecture on utilitarianism is about how the concepts of utility and liberty. What, what I like to talk about is the original idea, right? Based on science, social science, it was very optimistic. And then what's happened, right? America is saturated with those kind of ideas. 
what went wrong? <laughs> what are lessons learned? And especially what are the lessons learned for your countries? So that's kind of what I want to get into. Um, let's see, I am going to go to the screen share and do my usual thing. Um, first, let's go through, I made another document just separately with all the assignments because I don't know about you, but the letters are so small on that, that I can't see them. So anyway, I did want to say that I have, a, I don't have a lot of people who've written on St. Augustine, but honestly, they're all interesting. And you can take my word for it that students pick out different things. So I think learning how to find a worldview and live according to it is a very creative activity. When I teach philosophy of art, uh, what I teach is the most creative activity you ever engage in is creating your life, right? You are the artist of your own life. So that's what's going on here. Um, let's see. So then we had um, Augustine and then we went to Aquinas and um, a number of students really liked that. So very important takeaway from Aquinas and Martin Luther King and the Pope is that when you unite reason and faith, you definitely get rid of extremism in every religion. You also get rid of extreme anti-religion uh, obsessions among secular humanists, right? You just get rid of everybody that refuses to acknowledge complexity. And then within that, people disagree, but my suggestion is that an honest religious point of view would always involve examining people with power. So it would never blindly defend any status quo, any customs or habits. So religious people should, they really have to be based on reason and critical reflection. Because as soon as ideas like that are accepted blindly, uh, you can justify all sorts of abuses of other people who don't fit your orthodoxy. So I think religion, authentic religion should always be progressive and always be critical. And so that's just an idea to throw out there. I am a philosophy teacher, so I sort of have a right to that idea. You don't have to agree with it, but I do think you need to understand it. Um, and so the liberal, right, the liberal branches are the humanistic branches and the humanistic branches are liberal. They're, they insist on constant examination and re-examination of your own views and of other people and of your country and of your leaders and of anybody exercising power. Um, and, and there were a number of people raised Muslim who clearly think about these things. And that was nice. I mean, so there definitely are students whose posts are sort of like, aha, <laughs> you know, I hadn't thought about that before. And all of a sudden a new idea and I like this idea or it can be a new idea. And I know I really don't like this idea. <laughs> But other people think this way. I think it's crazy, but if I want to understand other people, I have to understand that they think like this. And so it, it's really fun and rewarding. Um, let's see. So uh, a number of you said they really like St. Francis's principles. And I again, I would like to have you really think about them because they all but a few of them, at least eight out of the 10 or whatever, strike me as completely consistent with any humanistic religion and any humanistic, any humanism that isn't itself some kind of obsession, right? So that's a billion people too that he represents. 
And so you can figure out, we can build bridges between people as we move forward. Also, it's at the United Nations. I think developing countries are much more respectful of the UN. Well, every other country is way more respectful of it than my country. So I think, I think as adults, you should be aware of what the UN has done, is doing in your country. And you should be critical in the sense of here's what here's what I think they do that's good or they've done that's good. Here's where I think they made a mistake. Um, and, and of course, you don't have to all of a sudden do a bunch of research on this tomorrow, but keep it in mind, right? It's in the back of your mind. Some news issue will come in. So you have an idea of the general relationship between your country and the UN. Um, when I was in Bangladesh, I read some articles. Somebody who worked there in security had published some stuff. And he said that Bangladesh disproportionately has sent um, uh, large numbers of soldiers into the UN force, which is great. So at least when I read about that, Bangladesh is a big supporter of the UN. Um, it doesn't mean everybody you know supports it, but I thought that was nice. It's very different from my country. Um, and then Martin Luther King, Black Lives Matter. So, so those things I think are all important. So that's my final, my final wrap up on that is to blow your minds in that way. Okay, then we go with utilitarianism. And I do want to blow your minds. How do I want to blow your minds on this? Hopefully last time, this huge gap between Bentham's view of pleasure, pain, and happiness, you know, anybody can do what they want as long as they don't harm somebody else. There's no higher or lower pleasures. And then John Stuart Mills, oh yeah, you can prove empirically that there's higher and lower pleasures. Now that should blow your mind, right? What? <laughs> I gotta think about this. How can they say, you know, this, these are incompatible positions and these guys knew each other, all right? They know that they're sending something out there that's very ambiguous. Um, and then when John Stuart Mill has this wonderful vision of a free and open society, but children have to be raised a certain way. So the government really needs to oversee how children are being molded. And if the government thinks it's wrong, you move them into some other, somebody else's house. Now, <laughs> I, if you live in Arkansas, uh, two thirds of the kids at least would be removed from their houses. Um, terrible problems with the foster child system because so much drug addiction. It was, it was just awful. And kids were growing up totally crazy, you know, out of balance and nobody was doing anything and the government tried and then keep the government out of my life. So it was, it was really bad. But what should you do? Right. And Mills said, well, when you apply for a marriage license, you should show that you have economic stability. Well, that assumes people don't have kids without being married, <laughs> which, of course, is a huge assumption. And so what do you do when these when a society it's society's fault if it habituates, it fails to habituate people and you have a whole lot of immature adults? <laughs> Well, we do have a lot of immature adults. So now what do you do, right? So question for you is, does that happen in your countries? And again, I have no idea. Um, I don't know if the force of religion prevents that particular kind of craziness. And instead you have the craziness of obsessive religion. I don't know, um, but I, Look forward to reading it. So that's the first issue is Bentham, uh, what is utility and um, happiness, pleasure, pain, and how can you link that to a free and open society? 
And obviously Americans have gone south, right? Something went wrong because they think they're free to deny that COVID exists. So there were uh, healthcare workers and a person would come into the hospital and they'd tell them you have COVID and the person would just yell and scream at them and say, no, there's no such thing. <laughs> okay. And so there's that. And then there's, well, there is something, but it's all China's fault or um, that I shouldn't have to wear a mask or right, I don't want the vaccine, but I also want healthcare workers to put their lives in danger for me because I definitely wanna to go to the hospital if I get sick. Um, there's no sense of what you do does harm other people. So they have this Bentham type idea, pleasure, pain, and happiness and Mill's freedom, but without any of a very false idea of when Bentham says you can do what you want as long as you don't harm somebody else. So that's what both Bentham and Mills said, but Americans are completely oblivious about the fact that everything they do affects other people. So again, does this happen in your country? Do you think you've caught this particular kind of Western disease or not? Um, and how do you, you know, how should your country move forward or yourself, really? You can say, well, I can't speak for my country, but you do want to know that these trends affect um, the way cultures work. You can always, you know, say, well, I'm going to, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I have the power, I want to move this way, you know? And that's all you can do, but that'll keep your psyche healthy if you decide what you think is true and you live the truth as you understand it. I think that's what you have to do. Um, so today, um, so actually I wanted to break you into groups about um, going back over what we covered last time and just giving you a chance to talk to each other about it, which of those, whoops, which of those readings, all of you should have come with three, three points that you wanted to make related to Bentham and Mill. So before I put you into groups, um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, so I'll put you in groups. And if your group is not lively, right? If, you know, people don't feel, you know, there's people there who don't feel this means anything to them, just let me know and I'll put you in a different group, right? There's no point in wasting our lives on. We have precious little time anyway in life. Ha, ah, philosophy. All right, there we go. <laughs> Let's see. Isabel, Rita, and Ritika. Okay. Aisha, Sharia, Shukti. Oh boy, okay. Ashlyn, Aurora, Diana, Pooja, Christina. Okay, okay, so I'm gonna move her to room one. and Soma to room four. Okay. Oops. All right. 
let's see, Fulluck is fine. Oh, hi, Fulluck. I was looking for you. Professor, when you put me in breakout rooms, I always get disconnected. Okay. So I'll, let me see. What I've done is I'm, now I have names of people that really are doing the posts, you know, and staying with it. So I must say, I really liked when you're talking about that you were raised with a very, with a kind of Islam that unites reason and faith. So I thought, I thought that was great. Um, so is the material sort of clicking with you then? Yes, Professor. Okay, good. I mean, I'm, I'm happy about that. So see, room two is disintegrating. I, <laughs> so I don't know what happened to that one, but I'll put you in room four here. Um, Aisha. Uh, professor. Yes. Uh, professor, there is no one in room two. Yeah, okay, that's true. So that's right, Aisha. Um, so I am gonna move you to some one where I haven't gotten any posts yet from the students or, um, well, let's see, I guess I'll just put you in the smallest one. It's number three, there you go. Okay, so yeah, so the woman who raised her kids as a humanist, she raised them as a John Stuart Mill, higher pleasures, social justice kind of humanist, right? And then you can think of moving forward. You're, you live in societies that are going to change so much over your lifetime. So moving forward, do you think your country should become less religious and more humanist? Or do you think it should become more humanist without be, having to be less religious, right? Just get people to unite reason and faith. We don't have to set up some kind of a animosity. Um, but let me- Professor, could you, yeah. please, could you please make it a bit more clear about the higher pleasure and lower pleasure concept of- Well, Stuart okay. Mill? Okay, so what do you think a higher pleasure is? Uh, so uh, what we have discussed in our group is like higher pleasure is something, I'm not sure professor, I'm just telling about the discussion part that we had. Higher pleasure is something, for example, I'm just telling in an example concept. One of our group members told, uh, in her cultural context or in her country, there is this kind of classism where people have like, the people who are having resources and who are rich enough, they are having a higher pleasure thing that like all the luxurious thing that we, they are having us their pleasure kind of thing. Yeah, so, those are not those are not higher pleasures. Those are more expensive pleasures. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to just differentiate. Right. Like, no, it's yeah. not material. OK, it's important to clarify that. No, no, it's not material at all. Because if you remember, greed is the political evil. Right? So having expensive material things is a lower pleasure and it destroys social well being. And people do. I mean, the mistake you made is exactly the mistake, right? That people make. That's not a higher pleasure. The higher pleasures are Jesus and Socrates and Muhammad and Confucius. They're poor, right? They're dirt poor, a lot of them. So they don't have material things and they don't care about material things, right? So they care about virtue, right? Mm -hmm. So a higher pleasure would be conversations about people um, sorting through their ideas about how they live and then living on the basis of ideas, people being informed about the history of their countries and being able to act on 
a combination of history and philosophy and theology and you know getting into conversations with other people so they start molding their character according to their ideas right and according to the lessons of history and all that sort of stuff the other higher pleasure is empathy that they care about other people that's the opposite of buying a lot of stuff right so I'm glad you asked. I mean, buying a lot of material things is exactly the opposite and it destroys societies, okay? Greed is the political evil. It destroys societies because the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, okay? And the other one is um, the arts. Having an opportunity, if you're musical, to become a musician and then having the opportunity to go to concerts to go to museums, to go to um, dance, dance recitals, you know, all those, the arts is it liberates your imagination, right? Um, so I'm glad you asked. Does that answer the question then? Yes, Professor, thank you. Okay, because like in, in Europe, people pay taxes and pay decent money for artistic groups and performances. Um, I think in Germany, they pay like $30 per person and they have all these theater and choirs and um, all sorts of symphonies, whatever. But in America, do you know how much we spend per person on the arts, public access to the arts? Somebody should guess. My students are totally appalled. 40%? What? 40%? 40%? Yeah. Okay, so it's a matter of dollars and cents, right? So how much per person? Okay, let me just give you a sense of how skewed my society is. Per person, we spend $2,200 per person on military and military related. We spend on the arts 80 cents, less than a dollar, yes. <laughs> and the politicians can say, we need a strong military. They get away with it every time. And you know, I tell my students, hey guys, do you know what the numbers are on this? And then they go, huh? <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy. And then I asked them how much, okay, a receptionist at a corporation makes a certain salary. How many times more does the guy at the top make? Um, oh, okay. How much does the guy at the top make? And I said, all right, you know, Let's say you had to go to college. You can make three times more, four times more. You had to go to college five times more, six times more. How much more compared to that person who works the 40 hours a week? How much more do you think the person at the top should make? You know, they say, well, they should make more. Well, okay, you find how much more, right? Okay, guys. Why don't at least three of you clock in? Like ideally, how much more should the CEO at the company get paid than the average Joe down at the bottom? I mean, you can't have a company unless you have a receptionist, right? I don't know, raise your hand guys, 10 times more? How many want 10 times more or less than 10 times? Let's do it that way. Oh, raise your hand. You have nothing to lose. Maybe a thousand times more. <laughs> you think a thousand times the person at the top should make it that should make. Should, should make. make, okay. No, yeah, I'm not saying does. Okay. I think a ten times is enough. Okay. How many of you just raise your hand, guys? How many of you think ten times more is enough? 80 cents for the arts, for, for public 
performances of symphonies or theater or music, things like that. Yeah. Okay, so how many of you, come on, thumbs up something. I want some feedback. Um, how many of you think the guy at the top shouldn't make more than 10 times because they can't work 10 times harder, right? If you're working 40 hours a week. How many, okay, how many of you think more than 10 times? They should get more than 10 times more. Come on. We're supposed to have, we're supposed to have this technology. You're supposed to raise your hand or put a thumbs up or something. Professor, I feel it should be less than 10 times. Okay. I feel like that. Well, okay. How many say less than 10 times? Come on, let's get a let's get a thumb or a, a hand or something. Okay. Five people raise their hand. That's good. Where are the hands? All I'm getting are the thumbs. Oh, there we go. Okay, less than 10 times. All right. Now, I want you to just to uh, think about, this is what I tell my students in America, right? Okay, in the 1960s, the top person got 60 times what the bottom person got, okay? But what do you think they get now? Anybody wanna guess? 350 times, 350 times. And yet the politicians still say, oh, you gotta cut taxes for corporations so you have jobs. 350 times, okay? All right. Now that's the segue into, this all ties back to ideas about utility and ideas about liberty. Do you all understand this? These people use Bentham and Mill uh, to justify this, okay? Is everybody, I, I just really want you to understand that. I don't think it happens in your countries. Um, how do they deal with it? How does who deal with what? How do the people at the bottom deal with the fact the people at the top are screwing them over? They love it, like it's capitalism. They believe in it. And mostly they just don't know, right? So they do not know what the difference is. But my job is to tell you that they can be convinced that this is the free and open society, right? So last time I talked about Donald Trump versus John Stuart Mill. Donald yeah, I remember. What? Yeah, I said yes, I remember that. Yeah, okay, good. Because Donald Trump says, I believe in maximizing happiness, pleasure in the absence of pain, and I believe in a free and open society and cut the taxes, no taxes, just let people work, whatever. And then they can use their money for whatever they want, right? As long as I'm not hurting anybody else, this is the good society, right? So that's what we've got now. Now I want you to segue into these articles about hedges by hedges and by, um, Alan Taylor. So now we're going back to Aristotle's virtues, right? Aristotle's idea of flourishing was virtues and greed is the political evil. Remember, generosity is a great virtue and magnanimity, all right? So that can take the form of private philanthropy, NGOs, the UN, these nonprofit organizations, or it can take the form of taxes and services so that the government provides public education. And the argument is that you will be happier if everybody in your country is literate, right? So if the overall happiness, people will be able to get jobs, all that sort of stuff. So Aristotle is a different is a different model, right? Especially the way people associate it. John Stuart Mill might say, oh, that's what I really meant, but that's not what he said. And it's not 
what happened. You know, when people in my country think of pleasure, pain, and happiness, and a free society, nobody telling me what to do as long as I don't hurt anybody else, they do not think of Aristotle, right? Aristotle wanted a much more involved political um, um, institutions, plus Aristotle condemned greed. So he wanted Aristotle advocated a very high inheritance tax so that you wouldn't have a class of people inheriting their parents' money, right? You have to make your own money. Um, but um, that's not what happens in the United States today. So the pleasure that comes from a profit, that's the greed. And Aristotle thought that was a problem. All right. So then we have, um, I had you reading this article by Alan Taylor. Let me just show you the original. I think I gave you three pages. But what I want you to do is not so much, I'm not teaching you American history so much. I'm teaching you like the lessons of history, right? So this is what went ha this is what was going on in the minds of the founders of America, because America was going to be this great free and open society, right? It was the great experiment of the enlightenment thinkers that people are gonna come to America, to all the class structure, all the inherited wealth, all the people passing their estates down. Here we have this land and this frontier and where everyone's gonna earn their keep, everyone's salary or wealth will be a function of the effort they make. And okay, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be utopia. People even thought that God, God was behind Christopher Columbus discovering America so that the Europeans could run this test case of their enlightenment point of view. Does that, everybody sort of, can you, can you wrap your head around the mindset at the time? Um, because something went wrong. And so I think there's a lesson learned for people in developing countries, right? That first of all, you need a well-informed electorate. The people who vote, once you give people the right to vote, they need to be informed, right? Otherwise, um, they, without, um, Empires and monarchies thrive without an educated populace, right? Uh, republics, the rule of law depends upon a broad electorate of common people who um, cultivate, this is it, the special character known as virtue, the capacity to transcend their diverse self-interest by favoring the common good. This is Aristotle's, everybody understand that? Aristotle's political virtues. Uh, if everybody just pursued their private interests, the American founders knew that would end up with authoritarianism. All right, so they needed to reform the morals and manners of the citizens, okay? I think in developing countries, people have had the habit of just you know, obeying, and now they need to develop this whole new set of habits of being engaged and informed, uh, of holding their leaders accountable. But again, each of your countries is different. Um, let's see, so that's, that's a big issue. They were very concerned with education. That's the key to avoiding a return to a strong man, right? a return to an authoritarian government. He distinguished between the old aristocracy of inherited privilege and a new natural aristocracy. And I think people in developing countries are trying to break out of that. I know even in Greece, which is supposed to be, you know, a European country, 
the, the three main political parties are old families. They're families that have held political power for a long time, even though officially, you know, they're voting, right? They still, they still keep choosing the same families. And I think developing countries um, have that issue of having dynasties instead of having people, new people have the opportunity to, to exercise political power. Um, let's see, and they got discouraged because all people cared about was getting rich. Now, obviously that happens in my country. The question is, does it happen in your country, right? Um, and people are apathetic and they're just obsessed about money and they don't develop citizen consciousness. Um, and then in the US, and this might happen in your countries also, that certain parts of the country are more progressive and they do tax people to, for education and they do have a much higher quality of education and that makes a huge difference. So I don't know how much you know about my country, but the South, where there used to be slavery, is so far behind. And they're so irrational. Anyway, um, what that happened way back, right? New York City got enlightened. And um, Thomas Jefferson made decisions that held the Virginia back for 50 years farther behind because of those decisions about education and how much money should be invested in it. Um, let's see, and then the US, for a while we had a lot of kids in college, um, but it's declining because we have a different philosophy. Now it's primarily economic, like the purpose of higher education is to make more money rather than to become a better citizen. And I do have students from AUW. They say that they're smart, they go to good high schools, but the underlying, the undertow is that this is an economic, you know, the point is to use your brains to make money. But um, AUW really has this philosophy, right? That women should develop their capabilities, but then give back. That's why you have programs in public health and all sorts of stuff. It's really designed for people to have this kind of philosophy. Um, let's see. So Americans lost something valuable when we gave up virtue as the goal for education and turned it into money. So think about that with your own country. What I'm hoping is that when you, you know, when you see your countries maybe falling into this pattern, you can go find this article and say, wait a second, that's what the US did. Let's not do that. Um, let's see. Uh, so that so that's the idea is that you have to have political virtues and the problem was greed, right? That was what corrupted it. And guess what? Uh, Mr. Hedges book, The Illusion of Empire is about how the US has been completely corrupted by greed. Every aspect of life is corrupted. So, so, and he knows that, he's read the classics, he knows. But what I wanted to give you first was just the outline of a whole chapter about how higher education has been corrupted. Um, all right, there's not, okay, so there isn't enough of teaching students to question and to think and self-criticism. So. He understands, okay, he was a Presbyterian preacher's kid. So the Presbyterian church unites reason and faith. And so it's always the people in those kind of churches in the US, they usually do get educated in something of the classics. So when I read his books, 
I'm a Methodist preacher's kid, you know, and my teacher was a Methodist preacher's kid. And we, he went from there to Greek philosophy. So I, I get this guy, right? I understand his line of thinking, but I, and I think that students at AUW should think about this, right? So when you posted about when you were reacting to that view that St. Thomas Aquinas united reason and faith and also promotes all sorts of social justice, that's a lot of students thought, yeah, you know, it's a good idea. So um, Hedges is coming from that same point of view. Um, if you remember, Francis is questioning political leaders He's, he's criticizing them, right? He's questioning religious leaders. He's questioning economic leaders. So he is being this voice of, of criticism. Um, and he doesn't have to go to jail or prison for doing it. <laughs> uh, not so far anyway. Uh, all right. Now there's another, okay. I don't know if this happens in your countries, I know that you all have to take some kind of really tough tests, right? At the end of high school, do a lot of you have to take some tests that you study for, for a long time? Yeah, okay. Well, in the US, of course, we make it into a business. <laughs> there are these tests that you have to take as part of your college application. But it's not government run, right? There's this private business and you have to pay mucho money. Um, and then in addition to that, Mr. Hedges had a child who wasn't scoring very high on those tests, the reading part, even though he actually read a lot. And so there are these companies making a lot of money coaching kids about how to get higher scores on those tests. Do you have that in your countries? Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, he had to pay $7,000. You don't have to pay $7,000. <laughs> but, um, and then the, the tutor actually told this kid, okay, so the kid, Probably he read and he thought about stuff, right? He's a critical thinker like his daddy -o, right? And he's not just blindly memorizing stuff. He's reading in order to think. And so the tutor, he paid $7,000 to a tutor and the tutor told him, don't think, <laughs> don't think. That's how you score high on the test, just stop thinking. And he scored 130 points higher on the test and he got into a better college. <laughs> now, the other thing that's really funny about this is that I took that test, right? And I used to think a lot, okay? I didn't read a lot, but when I read, it was for, you know, to think. I read in order to think, right? And, um, I told, I took some of practice. I mean, I'm the cheap version, right? You just, you buy this book for 20, 30 bucks and you just read it, right? I don't have $7,000. Okay, so, so I, I learned, you know, I taught myself. I remember telling myself the day, don't think, just stop thinking so you can take this test. And, and I still remember taking it because it was the only Saturday at that time in my life that I didn't spend the whole day thinking, right? I just had to stop. So, so I, I want you to, yeah, if, if your countries are also in that kind of a syndrome, right? It's gotten to be an economic thing and it's gotten to be, yeah. Anyway, this class is not like that, right? This class is for all those uppity people who think outside the box and they finally get credit for it, right? I'll give you some credit, you can move on. Um, 
So how much does the educational system encourage blind deference to authority, right? Don't question the free market. Don't question, you know, there anything that goes on. Just assume that you want to play the game and here's the game. Um, all right. After 9-11, and you can let me, I mean, you can think about whether this happened in your countries, the, the conservatives blamed the liberals. They said, God allowed this to happen because our nation was being taken over by the moral relativists, the feminists and the gays. I don't know if, if people in your country thought like that, um, but it is important, right? It's important if, if your country is um, criticizing critical thinking, right? But the educational system is just about money and deference to authority and doing whatever the West approves of, that's not gonna lead to a very healthy democracy, right? Um, then the free market, a rational person is somebody who calculates the most efficient means to their personal economic self-interest. So the new blind faith is that greed will save us, right? Greed is the salvation of a society. Do you understand how far this is <laughs> from the classics? And these people call themselves conservatives, right? And so one of those quotes in that previous article said that when the conservatives claim to be uh, following the founding fathers, it's a, it's not, it's a lie, right? The truth is exactly the opposite. They're, the American conservatives are advocating rational means calculating the best way to your own flourishing and happiness means money because then you'll give other people jobs or you'll buy stuff and that'll give other people jobs. Literally, they mean that. And they do it in the name of our founding fathers. Now, you have to think about if that happens in your country. Um, in my country, we also have a lot of people making a lot of money on war. And so we have greed is affecting our, um, whether we decide to go to war or not, right? If everybody's paying 2,200 bucks, somebody's making a lot of money, right? Then you have um, professors who specialize, who focus on jargon, who, who live in these silos. And again, I don't think you get these kind of professors at AUW because that's not what the people who interview them are looking for, right? The people who interview for jobs at AUW don't accept these people. I mean, you're, I think for the most part, so I think you're lucky because I think the vision, the mission of the school is the people who are doing the hiring know that they that there's going to be a lot of people like this who apply and they don't want them right because they want the students they don't want students to get all wrapped up in jargon right they want students to have values and a way of life um let's see oh he's talking about signing up for stuff um Berkeley uh, is a well-known, right? Highly respected school. It's they money is given for research and it's tainted by profit motive. Sports is overvalued. Um, if you just read this stuff, it blows me away, right? The management staffs went up 250%. Employees 24 and faculty 1%, right? And um, oh, just these facts about what's going on with higher education. So 
Again, you can compare this to your own country and go find data about your own country. Um, the classics are considered useless. Um, nobody reads them anymore. And also the way they read them is jargon. It's a silo. A lot of classicists are completely out of touch with what's going on. Then there's the children of the elite. Their parents bribe the colleges to get them in. Um, and J Jared Kushner, who's Ivanka's uh, husband, his dad gave Harvard millions of bucks right before his sons enrolled. And lo and behold, they got in, right? <laughs> oh, geez, it's so corrupt. Um, and then he talks about teaching the humanities and how it's dying. Um, all right, so humanities education and its value. Um, so, so I do think you should think of this because at AUW, this is it was based on having you you know you're forced to teach to look, take a bunch of classes. But that's why, like, there's a philosophy behind this. Um, and it it is partly so that you can be democratic leaders, right? So that you can lead your countries in ways that will move more toward democracy. And it will, and you start, you have this fundamental sense of the importance of education. So um, let me, I'm gonna talk a little bit more and then I'll put you in groups. So please, Write down three things you'd like to talk about in your group. So I hope you have, you know, you can, you should be able to come up with something. Um, now this, I assigned this assignment because we're back to that word happiness, remember? So Bentham has happiness. Um, as long as I don't hurt anybody else, I can do what I want. And Mill has a view of happiness, but these guys have a view. They really do think that what they do is maximizing happiness, pleasure, and the absence of pain. And it's, it's scary <laughs> because it doesn't involve critical thinking. It involves um, total dedication to the corporation like, and you have you just have to think positive and then you'll be a better worker and your employer can make more money off of you. But it's, uh, it's sketchy, right? Greed is behind all this stuff. Um, it's analogous to pray to God or Jesus for wealth, uh, success. And if you don't get it, it's your fault. So if you just maintain a positive attitude, you can have anything you want. And if you fail, well, you just didn't have enough positivity, right? <laughs> okay, so it's positive illusions, right? This woman is advocating positive for people to delude themselves, right? Because that'll motivate them. This is a PhD, right? Illusions are good for people. What? <laughs> Um, yeah, no more democracy. Um, let's see. Then you have this, this uh, fact about the American Psychological Association. This is important because this is a class in philosophical psychology. So you really need to read, especially the pages about the history of the discipline of psychology. It Psych psychologists have been hired to develop torture techniques, okay, <laughs> based on psychology, right? So it's a tool. Like once you learn about human emotions, you can manipulate them any way you want. And so this person, um, he's a Jewish person, you know, which is really blows me away. And Mr. Um, Hedges asked him, well, can't all this positive psychology be used to like for mass coercion by really evil leaders to manipulate the masses into following them? 
once you know all these techniques? And the guy answers, right? Well, that we, we have a very scientific approach, remember? John Stuart Mill and the Enlightenment thinkers thought the social sciences, the science of the brain, they're all gonna teach us how to get brain chemistry and how to get conditioning and how to make everybody happy. <laughs> and he's doing this, like he thinks he's doing this. This is the scientific um, study of positive psychology and um, but there's also this pseudoscience that life is a dog eat dog competition, but you have to separate the science, right? Nazism was the application of a lot of scientific ideas, right? Oh, but it's not our fault. It's not our fault. All we do is give people these tools for manipulating other people, but you know, we're not responsible. And, uh, you know, incidentally, you also get hundreds of thousands of dollars for selling corporations this stuff, right? All right, so professional psychologists. Is this a healthy psyche? Is the profession of psychology corrupt or not? What would an uncorrupted professional psychologist be like? And what is a corrupted professional psychologist? Um, they've lent their services to military intelligence uh, techniques for interrogation and control. Um, they know how to manipulate behavior. And so she, she's, and then Laura says that classical Western colonialism Proponents of globalization use the idea of social harmony. So it's possible to think of positivist, positivist psychology as one more tool of colonialism that Westerners will try to sell to the developing countries. And so I'm giving you a heads up, guys. You should know. If you're, you know, if your country is selling out to some of this stuff. Um, all right. So I hope I've given you enough to talk about in your groups and I will put you in groups. Does anybody have any questions that they think everybody's confused about? Just, you, sh you know, you were supposed to have read it before class. You might have come to class with ideas already, but in the midst of my talking about all this, something, some light bulb must have gone off. That's what I'm thinking, okay? Um, I, okay, I'm gonna, there you go. her to group. Unassigned, oops. Uh, oops. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, I will get you. Uh, room two is empty. Okay, Isabel, room four. There we go. Okay, Isabel, are you still roaming around? I have you in group four. Yes?
Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, to everyone. Take a break, everybody. Professor, can you assign me to a breakout room because I'm able to join after 20 minutes? Sure. But electricity. You can take a break. I, I, all right, then. Uh, I, I was like also apologizing because like I re rejoined, I tried to rejoin, but like the connection all, at the same time, the link that was provided was not able from that. I was not able to join. So I, I tried to log out everything and then I rejoined. Yeah, I, I completely believe you with all this stuff. Um, and I, 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 I sent you a mail with a screenshot. Like that. Um, into her life, like if she could make someone happy or if she could, uh, like if people could make someone happy with the resources or something that they have, not thinking it from a very material side, uh, if that brings a peace of mind to that particular person, so that that is the kind of happiness that she wants. That is what she has been seeing from her cultural perspective. That is what striked in her mind. But what we, like, but others told us, like, if you are having a lot of money and if that, your, if your material side is settled, that is when you have uh, happiness. So we kind of agreed if, so I'm sorry, my sister is getting okay. up. <laughs> so, um, so it's like, uh, it's, it's purely an individual perspective, like happiness is defined from an individual perspective, not from a general side. So what happiness for everyone is, whatever thing that brings you a peace of mind, it would be a very simple thing. Uh, one of our group members that excited me very much is that um, when she does a very small thing, that won't be a, a very uh, higher thing to be happy for. But if she cleans or if she reads a particular book of or if she cleans her place, that brings her happiness. Or if she um, submits her assignment at time, that gives a peace of mind to her. So I guess that's a very individual perspective that uh, we, we should define happiness. So that that actually drives us to a healthy psyche too. So that's a general discussion that we had, and that's okay. Good. To, yeah. Well, I mean, just every assignment that you hand in is connected to your thought that getting a degree is um, your way of flourishing, and then the next step is whether you want to use that degree to uh, benefit other people, right? And then you might make money, but it isn't for the sake of the money. 
Because if you decide you do it for money, what are you going to do if your boss tells you, you know, to fudge the books? Yeah. Right? Right? Or if you just don't like the company, it's too greedy. People are too greedy. They don't really care about other people. Well, what if that's the highest paying job you can get? Is that what you want? Right? So a lot of times the jobs where people care about other people, you aren't going to get the most money, right? Because um, partly you get paid more money because the atmosphere is unpleasant, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. you do always have to think about what your priorities are. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, I do think you also should think about the fact that AUW exists because some rich people decided they wanted to give back, right? Yeah. Yeah, like the Gates oh. family and stuff. Yeah, Professor, um, I found something interesting from what Ashley just mentioned about someone uh, talking about that when she submits assignments or yeah gets gets over with her homework that brings her happiness and what I find interesting is that this kind of happiness is perhaps um, based on the fear of the consequences of what might happen as a result of not submitting assignments in time or getting over with the homework and like the the fact that the happiness is based on fear, then what is happiness? What is the meaning of happiness on its own? Does it always have to be based on avoiding fear? Or is there something that can be just, you know, um, bring someone happiness without them fearing any kind of consequences? Sure, especially if you're St. Augustine, everything is based on guilt or fear, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, yep, I think, and I- Professor, go ahead. I something. Professor, I disagree with Sadhukunar because it is not like that, that because of the fear, because that is the enjoying moment that a person is, is doing on the thing. Like I mentioned that I, uh, when I'm playing with the face of my mom, so I enjoy it and that, that brings peace for me and uh, that is a kind of happiness and that is not every piece or some times it brings it uh, brings from or it comes from the fair like uh, doing assignments on time these things but it is because that brings peace to the person and that make a person happy i think that that is the root of the happiness of that. I feel like that. Okay, so one transition that you have to make in college, because I think pretty much before you get to college, so many of your choices, so much of your life was never based on your own choices, right? You didn't choose what family yes. happened. You didn't choose the soul extended family, you know, all, a lot of your relationships. You didn't choose what school to go to, or there were, you know, a couple choices maybe. You lots of it is just whoever you fall in with, right? Your friends are just whoever you happen to maybe grow up with or happen, whatever. But once you get to college, it's like you can start over. You're nobody's child and you're nobody's sister and you're nobody's whatever, right? You're just yourself. And so that's when you have to decide what you're going to live for, right? And so I do think you have to change your mental orientation from, I, I remember in high school, you know, get that assignment done, get that assignment done, get, okay. Then in college, it's sort of like, what do I want to study, right? What do I want to become? How do I want to, you know, develop my mind, right? How do I want to think? What do I want to value? So it's, you have to become a lot more active, right? Because if all it were is, is, is doing assignments, then 
your whole life, you're just going to do what somebody tells you to do, right? Eventually, you're going to have to decide, well, what situ what do I want to do? And I'll put myself into a situation where if I want to get to that goal, I will do this assignment, but only because I want the goal, right? So that that's kind of the, the switch. Does that make sense to you, Diana? Yes, Professor. Okay. Um, I actually was, after two years of college, I could not figure out I was looking for something and I didn't know and I couldn't find it. So I actually quit school, right? Because I, I don't want to just do assignments, right? I don't know what the heck's going on. I don't know what I care about. That's called sophomore slump. Don't you guys ever do that, okay? Uh, not a good idea. But I did go back to school. My father, you know, sort of nudged me back. And then I found a teacher that I liked and I found what I wanted to study. And I, you know, so a lot of the reasons you have to take all these courses you don't want to take is it so that you can get some choices, right? About what sort of meaningful things do people choose? And then you can go from just doing the assignments to going, oh, <laughs> I want to put myself in a situation where the assignments are about that because that's what I want because that's who I am. Um, and so the notion of happiness would be, you know, a sense of meaning and purpose. This is my greatest sense of purpose at the moment, right? This is what I think I can do that makes me happy that I think also other people need somebody to do, and I want to be that person doing that. Um, but it's very hard to get from Jeremy Bentham <laughs> to that. Does that make sense? All Jeremy Bentham says is maximize happiness and as long as you don't harm somebody else. That, that's very different than wanting to work on climate change or wanting to work on abused uh, women are wanting to work on teaching adolescents about menstruation. I had a student and that was, she was in a nonprofit where they just helped those young women because nobody talked about it, you know? Um, just all sorts of things that people develop a sense of meaning and purpose about because of their life experiences. They just sort of know that people really need this and I just happen to be a person that knows that they need it. And, so, and I think I can do that. So um, that's very different from Bentham saying, as long as you don't hurt anybody else, do whatever you want. Um, so Mr. Uh, Hedges is, is saying that that has morphed into money. The, the default is that, is that people start getting motivated by money and status and power. But they love to tell themselves, oh no, it's really positivity. I teach this positive psychology and, and so I'm a good guy and I do happen to make millions of bucks at it, but hey, it's not about the money. And then Mr. Hedges is, is he doesn't believe that. He thinks they're deluding themselves. And yet what they say, is that people need illusions, right? Do you remember the woman says people need to have these illusions about themselves and then they'll be more positive. Well, Mr. Hedges is saying, that's what you're doing. You have illusions about yourself and it's making you feel more positive, but you're a PhD, you know, you're a professional psychologist and you should be more of a critical thinker than that. You should know that these tools can get abused by power hungry people and you end up with a very authoritarian society. Does everybody understand that? Now, I don't know how many of you, again, so I don't know how many of you took this class because you are thinking you want to be psychologists, right? 
and that's good, right? So there's one whole side of asking, uh, studying it that's just well, what is a psyche and what kind of healthy psyche do I want? But there, if people want to become professional psychologists, then you can do that research paper where you find out what's going on in the profession. Or you can start with Mr. Hedges and his model of the corruptions of the professions. You could look, yeah, yeah, Aurora, I'll be there in a sec. You could look at the um, references at the end of the chapter if you want to do some kind of research about how psychology has been used to uh, promote torture, to construct torture, or to do some real big harm, right? So if, if that's just of interest to you, whether or not you want to be a professional psychologist, you just really would like to write about how these tools of manipulation, which were we are getting better and better tools for manipulating people because we know all this stuff about brain chemistry. Is that good or is that bad? Or do we really have to combine that with a sense of good and evil, right? We can't just say it's morally neutral. It's not morally neutral. And some psychologists delude themselves into thinking that it is. Um, anyway. Okay, so Aurora, what would you like to say? Professor, I have a question. Uh, I wanna ask you that happiness is the key to success or success is the key to happiness. Very good, right? Um, does, okay, and what do you mean by success, right? Yeah. Like success mean if I get good marks in exams or if I get a good job. Well, what's a good job, right? Yeah, like my dream job. Yeah, well, what is your dream job and why is that your dream job? Uh, like if I can get a job in Google, uh, I can get a good amount of salary and I can uh, provide my family. Okay. And I also did uh, yeah, social um, work. And Professor, just quickly interrupting. Um, Aurora mentioned, is happiness the key to success or success the key to happiness? So according to her, success is something else. It's not happiness. That's success. So I think that answered her question, right? In her context, her getting her dream job, getting good marks is the key to success. And therefore not happiness is the key to success because that's that was one of her first statements. Is happiness the key to success? But to her, something else is the key to success. It's not happiness in her case, right? No, no. If I get good marks in exam, is also I feel happy, right? Right. Okay. It gives me pleasure. Yeah. So I want to ask that. But you know what? If I'm not happy, then I can concentrate uh, on my work. So how can I get success? All right, you guys. What I want you to stand back and think about is that we were talking about religion not too long ago, right? And so you don't want to go to hell, you want to go to heaven, right? Is that success? Um, so what I want to point out to you is that you've been handed a number of different languages that give you worldviews. And when I, when I bring up one language, all these buttons go off in your head, right? <laughs> and then when I hand you this other language, all these other buttons go off, but wait a second. <laughs> What's the connection between these buttons and those buttons, right? What's the connection between the success, happiness, good marks, and going to heaven or hell, right? Does that, I want you to sort all that out because, yeah, you've been programmed so far in your life. You've been conditioned and you've had experiences and you have buttons, right? You have things that will lead in your mind to other things. 
Um, I can tell you, I have more buttons than an airplane cockpit, right? I have lots of buttons, but, uh, but I do want you to just notice that when I hand you this language of pleasure, pain, and happiness, how differently you think than when I handed you that language of free will, good, and evil, right? But you're the same person. And so I, I want you to eventually have some integrity. So for example, if you think God gave you some intellectual gifts and God wants you to develop those gifts and then God wants you to use those gifts to help other people, then, and that that's what is gonna make you happy and that if you do it well, you have a good reason to think the world will pay you for it and you will be successful. But what happens if, you know, you, you work hard and you do, you play the game by the rules and suddenly you find yourself in a situation where the people who define success for you are corrupt, right? They want you to do things like manipulate other people, delude them into thinking that they're going to be successful when you know they're not going to be successful. What are you going to do? Does that, does that make sense, Aurora? Just, I want you in college to start complicating things and start anticipating that life is really complicated. And you will have to make choices about which, what is your priority. Um, yeah. Does that make sense, that Aurora? Sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And um, that's why I like to pick students' brains, right? And, um, and so that you will pick your own brain, right? And figure out how does all this stuff fit together? I also want to apologize because college professors get PhDs in these specialized disciplines and those disciplines were constructed to hate each other, right? <laughs> to not fit together, right? Bentham hated religion. So the way Western culture emerged is that the academy at this point hands you stuff that the original founders thought was completely incompatible with other stuff. So I feel sorry for college students because they're given these incompatible, contradictory worldviews and nobody ever points that out because everyone's so specialized. But this class is just your opportunity to figure out, you know, how am I going to fit all this stuff together and leave college with a sense of meaning and purpose? I might change it, I might grow it, but I'll have something coherent to go on. Does that make sense to people? And I, and I do want you to realize corruption, there's a lot of corruption out there. And people are deluded. People deceive themselves about whether they're corrupt or not. And people always justify what they do as some sort of good, right? So those psychologists think they're wonderful, like they're God's gift because they're making people feel happy or telling people to feel happy. And these other psychologists are saying, you're just setting people up for failure, depression, suicide. You're, you're setting them up not to be able to just look at life and deal with life and develop strength of character. Um, so uh, so uh, on the one hand, Mr. Hedges is talking about America. But I do wonder and I, how much we have exported this and how much uh, the best and the brightest, right? You are some of the, the best students in developing countries. 
how influenced are you by this? Because you're going to be the leaders, right? I don't know. I mean, some of you might anticipate having leadership positions, but even those of you who aren't thinking about that, just by virtue of having this particular degree, you are going to, you know, move forward. And so you really should think about how you want to use the authority that you have. Just by being a college student, just by being a college graduate, you have a lot of authority, right? So you just need to be careful about how you're using it. Um, and I don't think Bentham is right when he says, I can do anything I want as long as I don't hurt anybody else. Well, when the college educated people in a society ignore what's going on and don't think they have any obligation, you, people are getting hurt because they need, they need educated people to lead. So that's my little sermon. Shall I make you feel guilty now? Put in a little Augustine, you're gonna to go to hell if you don't do this, guys. Uh, <laughs> that's Bentham, I gotta use pain. All right, so um, that's the next post, right? You, you do that, what do you think about all that stuff? And then for next week, so we have about 40 minutes, um, why don't you take five minutes, another five minutes? Wow, because um, it's gonna shift gears. This guy is very different. And this is what I mean by you get thrown this stuff at you that is gonna make you schizophrenic or psychotic if you take it all seriously, right? Uh, so you have to figure it out anyway. Are you all, do you all think it's okay to get another five minute break? I'm just repenting for the fact that I forgot before. <laughs> yes, professor. Okay, so go ahead, jump up and down for a while. <laughs> Thank you, professor. Of course. Let me see what I'm going to do. Um,
Okay, I'll, I think that was five minutes, whatever. Um, so when I, when I say that you get handed these worldviews that are totally incompatible, um, the first contrast, so we had Aristotle, right? That you should take pleasure in doing what's noble. Then you had Augustine that said, by nature, we don't, right? By nature, because of the fall of Adam, we want to do what's wrong because it's wrong. So, I mean, they completely disagree with human nature, right? Um, so now you have to figure this out. Like Aristotle said, children aren't born good or evil, but if they if they are raised to have vices they will be physically unhealthy they will not be able to make friends they will you know they won't be well functioning members of the species you really have to raise kids to let, to exercise these virtues in order for them to flourish as a species because we are so social and um we are social and political by nature and the ability to have good relationships is basically fundamental to our ability to flourish. Okay, Augustine comes along. No, no, we want to do what's wrong because it's wrong. And the only way to be able to be good is through the grace of God and prayer, sacrifice, okay? We have to go against our nature in order to be virtuous. All right. There you go. You can try that one on. And then Bentham comes along, you know. Oh, well, then Aquinas says, wait a sec. We can put those together. That um, we want a good religious person would make good judgments, would be involved with all those virtues. But they also not only do they make good judgments about how to treat people, but they also always 
love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, they forgive people, right? Seven times, 70 times. They have mercy. They go over and above, right? Um, and that requires the grace of God, right? To do superhuman, basically, um, way beyond what's just necessary for flourishing. Um, but you can put those together. You could say like your faith puts your heart in the right place, right? I want to love this person or I do love the person Hate, love the sinner, hate the sin. That's what my students used to say. Okay. So, okay, my general attitude is always forgiving and mercy. And now I've got to figure out how to set up a decent criminal justice system, not based on revenge or punishment, uh, but based on flourishing, you know, wanting these people to eventually get out and, and live a good life. So yeah, one of the students pointed that out, the difference in Finland, um, they have a criminal justice, a punishment. They, I mean, they have a prison, which is just um, a sort of set of buildings on an island where they live in dorms and they work on jobs and they're treated like adults and they get money to spend at the canteen and and it's just sort of like learning, relearning how to live or learning how to live without needing to resort to violence. Um, so there are, you know, people are, those are two basically different positions that flourishing and being good deep inside, that's what makes people happy. And you have to condition people or recondition them um, but as opposed to no, okay, and then St. Thomas comes along, no, we can do both of these, plus social justice is really important. You can't, do you remember the section on suffering? There were all those different kinds of suffering, and the sources of the suffering, physical, some of it's genetic, some of it is because of your diet and lack of exercise, right? So I went through that whole list and then there were the, the suffering caused by injustices and unjust society. So St. Thomas's view, you should be working on all of those all the time, right? Or whenever you decide what to do with your life, you need to take all that stuff into account and decide, well, which thing that I can do do I think has you know the most positive ripple effect, right? Politically, socially, personally, at all these levels, what can I do that I think has the most, puts the most karma out there in the world or whatever, right? Um, so that's that, that's the old model. Then we have the new model right, based on modern science, social science, fact gathering. And that is that, as a matter of fact, people seek happiness, pleasure, pain, blah, blah. Um, and that's what we studied today. So you need to sort through your mind, right? How do you associate those words? Um, can you get from the claim that I can pursue pleasures, whatever I want, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else versus I wanna do uh, what I can do that helps as many people as possible at as many levels as possible, right? That's very different, uh, very different goal. And um, the moderns, right, modern, culture, the enlightenment, they just, they separated facts from values, all right? Values are superimposed on facts. So the church has a set of values that's supernatural, superimposed. 
They don't want anything to do with that, right? So John Stuart Mill says, these higher pleasures are similar to what the church wants you to do, but I'm arguing on the basis of science and facts and research and evidence and everybody who's been exposed to both. He wants desperately to make it a scientific endeavor so that it's not, you don't end up with God's will or heaven and hell or something like that. He wants to make this world a better place, right? You can measure it. You can, okay. So um, then if people have this enlightened view based on data about real happiness, then adults can be completely free because they're mature, like they're real adults. And then they can have free speech and free association and all this stuff. Well, what happens if you raise a bunch of immature adults? What are you going to do, right? Yeah, big problem. <laughs> um, and that obviously has happened in the United States. Now, I know it's not true in your countries because you guys are perfect and we're not. <laughs> Okay, yeah, those Americans are totally ruined by money. Not my country. We still have religion or we still have whatever. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so, so I, I really do want you to think about Mr. Hedges and his claim that money has corrupted everything because if like someone was saying in their group, they said material pleasures, having nice material things is the higher pleasure. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? If, if your country goes that direction, it's going toward greed, right? It's going toward where America's going. And so that's why I'm saying, have you, have, has your country bought into this? You know, because Hedges is saying it's fake, don't do it. This is not real development, right? This is going to lead nowhere. Um, so uh, let's see. So that, and then Mr. Taylor's article was about even the founding fathers of America knew that people have to cultivate those Aristotelian virtues, the virtue of the citizen. And that's why they started liberal arts colleges, all right? That's exactly the foundation for liberal arts colleges in America. It was the union of reason and faith. And they, th and they knew that this is absolutely critical for preserving democracy. Because if you separate those two, in the name of God, you will get a very corrupt leader who will wrap you around their finger like what's going on in Europe, okay? So the kind of things I'm asking you to do are the kind of thinking that ever since the origin of this tradition was designed to enable graduates to go out and preserve societies where people can rule and be ruled in turn. In other words, to avoid authoritarianism. So this is the kind of education you need to avoid authoritarianism. And you can be plenty smart, but, it, but you can be willing to fall into place, right? And to delude yourself into thinking that you're helping people when you're not. So you have to be really careful, right? You cannot just accept those words, happiness. Um, let's see, so his main thing in those two chapters was about how PhDs and Berkeley, you know, these highly respected colleges have been totally corrupted by greed. And if you want to find out what's going on in your countries, right? How much of the research done 
at the major universities in your countries is funded by Western or Chinese corporations, right? And so it's, it's tainted, right? Or whatever. And it is really hard for uh, people in developing countries, for the leaders. For example, I, just when I was in Indonesia, um, the Westerners come in there and say, look, we're going to start a, they have this huge minerals something fact, factory in um, Freeport, it's called. But there's so much corruption and degeneration of the natural resources. It's just awful, right? Pollution. But how can the leaders, they can't say, they can't kick them out because they provide jobs for a lot of poor people, right? And so a lot, so I think it's very difficult for you, your countries to avoid being exploited by the wealthier countries, right? Um, but I do think as an educated citizen, as an educated voter, you should stay aware of it and you should make judgments about it, right? That, okay, I'm willing to put up with this degree of corruption, but this particular country in, I mean, company in this particular project, that's, that's over the top, right? So that's a kind of Aristotelian judgment where you don't say it's absolutely wrong or it's absolutely right to have this research motivated by money. It's not necessarily good. It's not necessarily bad but let's just start making some distinctions. And so, you know, I think a healthy psyche, right? A healthy psyche understands that we're social and political, that everything we do and think has a ripple effect on everything around us. We are creatures of culture. And so part of that is being informed. And another part of that is you don't have to get depressed about it. Right? You don't have to get emotionally upset about the fact that you cannot control these things because just to be informed is enough. If that's what you can do, that's important because um, when citizens are informed, then they can make good judgments about a whole lot of things in their lives as long as they are constantly aware of the way everything's interconnected. Um, so here's the next uh, wrench in the system. Um, so the issue there was how you define pleasure, pain, and happiness, and everything is pleasure. Now, Immanuel Kant has exactly the opposite point of view, okay? That everything you do should be driven by your reason, all right? not by fear of hell, but by reason. And so I'm going to cover for the next, I have 25 minutes, but um, I don't know if I'm gonna do 25 minutes, but the idea I want to plant in your brain for before you leave is what do you think of the idea that you should only be motivated by pure reason? right? Reason without any emotions. You have one emotion, the desire to follow whatever your reason tells you is right. So uh, what I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And then for next time, I'm going to add some applications of that, right? Just like I did this time. The first time I posted the Bentham and Mill, and then the next time I posted Glenn Hedges' application and Alan Taylor's application. So I, I have some documents on Kant in the post for today. And next time I'm going to have the set of documents about how people who were trained in Kant, how they applied it and whether that was fair to Kant and but whether it's understandable that it could happen. So what happened was Kant advocates 
one desire to follow reason. And, and um, a psychologist would probably say that is unnatural and unhealthy, right? So how are you going to balance out the psychologists that say, we just want to make people feel happy and positivity, right? And the psychologist or someone like Kant that says, forget all that. It'll never make you happy. You just grab it. You know, you just, you're all over the map. You should have this one emotion, which is to honor the infinite worth of your capacity for reasoning, right? If you just constantly uh, meditate on that, then you can be free of all this other crap, you know, all these other moods and impulses and all that stuff. So that's the thought that I want to leave you with and then how it got corrupted. Um, and whether you think it's understandable or not. So let me do, I think the, the section on Kant's ethics, again, that's too technical. If people who take my other class, they know the background, that's fine. But not this class. This class is, let me just give you his method for teaching ethics. Um, first of all, he's arguing that, that it makes sense that we have free will in our heads, okay? So here is how his head is working. He taught Newtonian physics. I don't know how many of you have taken Newtonian physics. I did not take physics. I should have taken physics, but I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do. <laughs> it was the 60s. And that's too bad because, I mean, really, my brain would work better if I knew a little more of that stuff. But anyway, so Newtonian physics has this system of laws, right? Gravity, all these scientific laws, and they all fit together. And at the time, of course, things have changed since then. Einstein blew this whole thing out of the water, but it still affects the way we think. So at the time, all those laws fit together. They were internally logically consistent. They were comprehensive and they were all universally true, necessarily true, um, objectively true, right? So when I drop this pen, the law of gravity takes hold necessarily every time, right? It's absolute, it's objective, and your reason understands that. So what Kant says is that our minds impose these categories onto the world so that we can understand the world. Okay, so we take whatever it is, our reason. Our reason allows us to take in certain things with our senses, only those aspects of the world that we can then uh, put into our system in the brain and crank out the body of scientific laws, okay? But we, we have, it's reasonable to think there's more out there than we can understand. And also, when we have this body of scientific laws, there are questions we can't answer. Like, is there a God? How did all this stuff come to be in the first place? Um, and we can't know if there's an afterlife, right? We can't know if um, everything we do. What about human behavior? Right? So we know that the, the behavior of things in the natural world occurs by necessity. Okay? Well, what about human behavior? So if human behavior occurs by necessity, you know, you're just like a, a robot, you're just 
living out the same scientific laws and then and then you're not morally responsible for what you do right it's all determined um but kant says in our heads we we tell each other um this is a description, right? Somebody says you ought not to do that. So we are aware of the fact that we have choice. And it's not a delusion because we're aware of the difference between being motivated by pleasure, pain, and happiness or being motivated by pure reason. Pure reason has nothing to do with pleasure, pain, or happiness, okay? Um, this is the source of our dignity. This is what gives us infinite worth. So you should be taught from a young age to have the highest respect for your own power of reason and to follow the moral law. To put everything else, nothing else matters as much as the sanctity of following what my reason tells me I ought to do. And I ought to do it just because reason says so. You, you shouldn't say, I ought to do my homework because then I can make more money, right, eventually. Or I ought, there's no ulterior motives, right? You ought to do something because it's the right thing to do, and that's it. Um, so, and not every decision is a moral decision either. Um, like deciding whether to do your homework after class or tomorrow, right? That's not a moral decision. So, but when it comes to decisions about good and evil, justice and injustice, you should never act on emotions or speculation about happiness. You always have to just act on principle. So the method, you develop the habit of judging actions according to whether they're motivated by the moral law. You sharpen those judgments, whether it should be taken out of respect for the moral law. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, so when we're aware that we can choose out of respect for the moral law or inclination, that means we have a free will. We must have free will, right? Or we wouldn't have that consciousness of two different possible motives. So the power of free will is the power to actually decide which of those motives we're going to act on the basis of. Okay, let's see. You will, the best way to be truly free is to be free from all these distractions of inclination. There will be the sense of inner freedom, right? Um, moral character, all right? As opposed to Aristotle. The notion of having a strong character means that you act on principle, okay? You do it because it's the right thing to do. You don't do it because you're afraid that you're going to go to heaven or hell or something. You don't do it because your mother get mad at you or something. You just do it because it's right. Um, all right. So... Kant has some examples. Let me show you the examples. Okay, whether or not to commit suicide. All right. Why do people commit suicide? Well, some inclination, right? Some pleasure, pain, they get depressed over something. Stop. Don't think about any of that stuff. Just say... What can I tell myself, can my reason say is a universal law? What does reason require? Well, nothing that loves itself will kill itself. Rational nature 
is of infinite worth, okay? So rational nature loves itself, right? It's of infinite worth. Nothing else in the universe has as much value as rational nature, this capacity to act on the power of reason. So no rational creature will kill itself. It's like a contradiction. It's like a square circle, right? He's a mathematician, okay? He's doing it like math. He's trying to get you aware of your reason. And that's, that's like in geometry, where you have this definition of a point and a definition of a line and a definition. None of those things really exist in the material world, but you start out with those definitions and then you see what follows, right? Same with Kant, right? He decides our capacity for reason is completely unrelated to the physical world, but it's the way we filter in and experience the physical world. Okay, so he defines it that way. He says that we can act on the basis of pure reason. There's no way that you can be in your right mind, that you could be in a rational state of mind and kill yourself because you're treating yourself like a mere thing, okay? Like an animal. You're not treating yourself like a rational creature, all right? So... That's the first one. So my idea, the idea you have to get here is that he's doing ethics like a proof, right? <laughs> like a proof in math, you define numbers or whatever. It's deductive. It starts out with a set of definitions and then what follows. Whether or not to tell a lie. All right. What is language? Language is the product of human reason, right? Animals don't have reason, they don't have language. They communicate pleasure and pain, but they do not communicate acting on principle, right? The cow doesn't tell her baby cow, you know, you should treat your brother well because it's the right thing to do, right? They don't. So language is, necess is by nature a set of universals. It's, it's designed to communicate with other people about other things than just pleasure and pain. So it's, it's uh, something that we have because of our reason. So to tell a lie is to take that capacity for language and for universals and to completely corrupt it, right? To know that you're using this language that's the tool through which we understand the world and you're using it to um, say something you know is false about the world. So nobody could be in a rational frame of mind and tell a lie. The only motive is inclination. You couldn't possibly be acting on a moral law and telling a lie. You can't worry about the consequences. Um, all right, similar to that, no false promise is intended to be kept. Uh, all promises by definition are intended to be kept. So a false promise is a not a real promise. Um, False promises are, are, they use language, but they abuse language. And so no rational creature would make false promise, make false promises or abuse language in any way, basically. Whether or not to cultivate a talent, right? If, if your rational nature makes these talents possible, and cultivating the talent is part of exercising your rational nature. There's no way you cannot cultivate it. Once you know you have the talent, uh, by your reason tells you you have to cultivate it. 
The only reason you wouldn't cultivate it is inclination or emotion, right? Whether or not to be generous, okay? This is the golden rule, right? That all rational beings should treat other rational beings as of infinite worth, okay? And so if you have the resources to help another creature of infinite worth, you must, you know, if you're rational, you will instantly understand that you need to do that because this is what is of ultimate value. So it's the only reason people are not generous is because they've been corrupted by pleasure and pain and inclination. They're being motivated by um, our lower pleasures, right? Our, you're treating yourself like a mere thing, like an animal rather than like a rational being. Um, all right. So that's, that's the idea for the next class. And um, I do, what I want to impress on you is that these different frameworks have had this impact. And so if you, if you compare Kant to Augustine, for example, Augustine used math also, right? And he, he founded his view on a, a notion of eternal law, but, and it was free will also. But Augustine had no problem using pleasure and pain, right? And guilt, right? You're gonna go to hell if you don't do this. Um, and the temporal world is nasty, so don't touch it, you know. But Kant, you know, he doesn't, he wants it to be based on pure reason, right? He does think that it makes sense. If you have free will and your reason is always telling you that good people should experience happiness and bad people should, right? But that doesn't happen and you're not, that's not your motive but it makes more sense to think that the soul is immortal and there is a final reward and punishment. And, you know, good people get a reward and bad people get punished because your reason absolutely can't function unless you believe that ultimately the demands of reason um, win out in the end. And so he says it's more rational to believe in these things, but he doesn't try to punch the button of guilt, right? He tries to punch the sense of the, the, ulti, the infinite value of our capacity to reason. Um, so the woman who raised her kid being a secular humanist, she said she was raised uh, Calvinist, which is Protestant. Kant, Kant represents the Calvinist point of view. Mr. Calvin was very rational, um, but he, yeah. So it's, it's um, similar and different to Augustine. It's just an enlightenment point of view and he bases it on modern science. Now, how are we maintaining this sort of um, mindset? Is that Kant is the beginning of uh, artificial intelligence, a notion of rationality that isn't necessarily connected to people at all. So Bill Gates at one point said, um, you could take, um, rationality and tie it to a different material substance, right? You could make silicon, I don't know. You don't need a physical body. You don't need your biology. You don't have to be an animal to have this capacity for reasoning. And so that's where we get robotics and we get, you know, are robots gonna be able to think? Are robots 
going to be able to feel. These are all the Kant types, okay? <laughs> and then computer science and all that stuff. Um, so that's the branch that Kant started this whole notion of, of um, pure reason. That is the way people think when they're engineers, when they're constructing skyscrapers and all that. They're not thinking about how many animals and plants they're killing, you know, they're not thinking about the place of the skyscraper in the ecosphere or the, I mean, in the biosphere, right, or the ecosphere. They're not thinking in terms of um, environmentalism. They're thinking this pure thing that we impose on the world. And so we have a culture where I'm sure in every developing country, there are engineers and engineering programs. And they, up until recently, especially, they would not get rewarded at all for being uh, having any concern for environmental problems. Um, so I'm going to just leave you with that idea. And then I will post some of these examples. And when I post those examples, I want you to come to class saying, was that a fair application of Kant? Or was that an understandable way that Kant could get abused? I'll say that in the stream too. But I do want you to think about this stuff like, oh, really? I don't know. Okay, so have a good day, guys. And I will have a good night. All right? All right, Professor. See you. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor. Do you have questions, guys? Any questions, guys? Okay, I'm gonna shut down the meeting unless people have questions. Professor? Yeah? Um, can we book an appointment with you without, uh, I mean, instead of your office hour? Sure, what's a good hour for you? Um, I'll try, try to discuss with one of my friends because she's also want to uh, book together with me. So maybe we will figure out the time, then we'll let you know. Okay, so remember that, um, let's see, nine o'clock my time is mm -hmm. eight morning Bangladesh time. Sure, 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 I remember. 11 hour difference. Um, and I usually don't wake up I usually stay up till 2 a.m. and I get up at 9. So okay. um, 9 a.m. my time would be, I think, 8 p.m. your time. Yeah, sure. No problem. No problem at all. We can adjust. So we understand also. Yeah. Okay. So to adjust this time, maybe we can talk around like 9 a.m. or nine uh sorry 10 a.m your time we will try to adjust so why don't you email me when you just yeah, sure. 
Yeah, okay, great. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Have a good night. <laughs> yeah, you too. You have a good day. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? <laughs>